So in this, this last lecture that I'm going to give on uh, spatial data and how we model spatial data, um, I want to bring up a, a really important topic, uh, which is called the spatial misalignment problem. And this, this spatial misalignment problem actually is really common in environmental sciences, where we have a lot of spatial data. Uh, it's also known as the change of support problem. And it's, it's, a, it's an area where uh, the status quo in a lot of our fields actually uh, can really abuse uh, data uh, and, and often lead to, to very falsely overconfident inferences. Uh, and you know, one of the most important things that I'm interested in here is, is in some sense just introducing the name of this thing so that people are aware of this and are aware uh, of how to, at, at a high level, how to address these problems to be able to dive into these topics more more deeply on their own. So what is the change of support problem or what is the spatial misalignment problem? It arises when we often need to uh, compare, compute, or infer uh, spatial information at, at different points or different types than the original data that we have. Uh, so a simple example would be if we observe data at one set of points and we want to make inferences for a different set of points, you know, that is essentially the definition of our, our, our Kriegen problem. We want to spatially uh, infer what's happening at a different set of points than where we observe the data. And uh, it's a really common problem. We want to use this to make maps. We use this if we want to uh, include so we want to make inferences about some relationship with some some set of x's and some set of y's but the x's and y's aren't always observed at the, the same location so we need to infer the values of x's at the values that we observe are y's uh, and one real key important point here and this is why it's really important to emphasize uh, this is that the standard way that a lot of folks approach this and, and this is not people's fault. I mean, it's, it's built into a lot of the GIS software that people use for spatial analysis in the environmental sciences. Uh, by default, result uh, approaches this problem by trying to interpolate or regrid data. Um, so you know, you have data at one set of points, uh, and you need them at a different set of points. You know, you could just interpolate those and use those interpolated values. Well, that can be really dangerous. Uh, because it can misrepresent the sample size of data that you actually have, and it can misrepresent the uncertainties you have about those. So again, you know, that was one of the key advantages when we were talking about Krieging, was that when we do Krieging, it actually provides us an estimate of not just the value at a location, but the, uh, the, the standard error associated, the variance associated with that spatial interpolation. And then we talked about Bayesian Krieging, we talked about the fact that we can also account for uh, you know, the process error uh, in the, the, the parameter error in that Krieging model when it makes that interpolation. Um, and if you're then going on to use those spatially interpolated values, it, well, I, ideally you would be fitting one giant model that includes the spatial interpolation and any further inference at the same point so that you fully capture the covariance structures between different types of errors. Uh, but if you're unable to do that, that you need to uh, go back to things we talked about in the middle of the semester, like errors and variables, and you need to bring in uh, the errors in those uh, variables, and, and not just naively at a point, but you, you ideally would be bringing those in in terms of the covariances uh, across locations as well. Because again, when we're dealing with spatial data, the spatial covariances is really a lot of what's uh, key to making those inferences. So in addition to the problem of making uh, observations of one set of points and making inferences of another set of points, we find that, uh, that this can also show up for all of our combinations of point and block data. So you might be observing data at points, but you want to make inferences at blocks. So you have some set of sample points and you want to understand what's happening at some larger, uh, say, political unit. Um, you have inferences. Alter alternatively, you might be getting statistics at some uh, block level, say uh, county level data, and you actually want to make inferences back to 
uh, that continuous surface that would allow you to say what's happening at any point. And then sometimes you have observations in one set of uh, polygons and you want to make inferences about a different set of polygons. And again, the natural thing to do here would be to do things like interpolation or regridding, uh, which can lead to a lot of problems and, and a lot of falsely overconfident inferences. So imagine, imagine a case where you know, I have uh, 100 data points and I in use Krieging to interpolate those to uh, a, an image, a map that has a million points in it. Uh, and then I take those million points and throw those naively into the next analysis that I do. Uh, even though I have only have a, a sample size of 100, I'm now treating that as if it had a sample size of a million. And everything I do with that will be uh, really falsely overconfident. And, and part of that is the interpolation that I've changed the actual sample size. And part of it also is that I've ignored all the uncertainties associated with that interpolation uh, and the covariance. So that you can massively misrepresent the information content uh, in our data through naive approaches. And we can, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really important to not make falsely overconfident predictions. Okay, so we talked about uh, moving from points to points. Uh, next, kind of talking about moving from points to blocks. So you collect uh, data at points in space and you want to make inferences about the integral of that. So I, I have you know, I put out forest inventory plots and I want to estimate county level carbon stocks or biomass stocks. Um, the traditional approach to this is just to calculate a sample mean and, and variance. Uh, doing so could result in ignoring uh, the spatial autocorrelations within a county. Uh, so you'd want to take that into account. And it could also ignore that that, that those fine spatial scales, you might have covariates uh, that are explaining patterns that you need to uh, actually account for. Uh, so a recommended alternative, if you need to, essentially if you need to upscale uh, from point data to, to larger data, uh, would be to to actually build a, a Bayesian spatial model that has covariates uh, and project that to a fine grid resolution. Uh, and then from that grid, uh, numerically integrate up. So if I have 100 data points, I you know, interpolate to you know, a grid uh, that could be at a million points. Um, I produce, but I produce you know, thousands of maps and I, for each of those maps, I can sum up the predictions, say, for a county. Uh, and I'm doing that for each map, not for each grid point. And that's really important because by summing that up uh, for each map, we're accounting for the spatial covariance within that map. Um, and then because you know, each MCMC iteration will give a different map, you can do that sum for each map. And then we'll get a, you'll end up with a distribution of county level statistics from each of those maps. And again, the, the more you can include uh, covariates that actually explain the spatial process, the less you actually rely on spatial covariance. Um, and the more likely that your uh, upscaling is going to be you know, sensible. Um, and the opposite, sometimes you have uh, data have block data and you're trying to make inferences about this, again, the smooth underlying uh, surface. Uh, and sometimes that can just emerge out of writing a process model uh, that describes that smooth underlying surface. Uh, but sometimes uh, it can also occur uh, by, uh, you know, you could write down a model that makes inferences based on some fine resolution grid. Uh, and then your data observations come by writing a data model that compares uh, the sum or the integral over that grid uh, to the actual uh, observ observed data. So you can imagine that your inference might be being occurring on some fine spatial resolution, fine grid, uh, but you write down a likelihood that says that the probability of observing uh, this value in this particular ward I, to get that expected value, to compare that expected value to the observed value, I have to sum up all these points and divide by the number of points and compare that to what's actually observed. And, and as long as that underlying spatial model 
include something like a spatial covariance, you know, you're going to generate a smooth, smooth underlying surface. Um, and then again, there's this problem of moving from uh, blocks to blocks, um, where you might have, you know, here I might be involving some, you know, a data set on, on population density that's reported on some political unit. And here I have this data on structural density, which I believe might be coming from things like radar backscatter. Uh, and we need to, you know, you know, for any, you know, if I want to move one of these to the other, for any particular one, we have, you know, multiple sub segments. So you need to kind of do this aerial allocation uh, where you divide up, um, into a polygon into its component pieces, but acknowledging that uh, those component, it, it's not just a simple weighted sum because it's different uh, subcomponents may not represent the same underlying smooth surface. Uh, so again, you know, what you often are going to do in practice is, is to thinking about a process model, either on a grid or continuous, that is, is occurring at some underlying uh, spatial resolution that's much finer so that you can do these, these uh, you know, inferences uh, from uh, one set of aerial method. So essentially, you would do something like coming back to here. I right? take one set of polygons, infer it to some smooth, smooth underlying surface, and then I would apply that this new set of second polygons to that smooth surface and aggregate that up to a new set of blocks. So you know, we're often doing block to block by transforming through a smooth surface underlying it. Um, so in addition to uh, needing to change support for a, a data set itself, some set of Ys, we also frequently will re run into the problem of needing to change support and trying to understand the relationship between one set of Xs and another set of Ys. So here we have an example map of uh, our, our Ys, which are, uh, counts of pediatric asthma uh, by zip code in the Atlanta uh, metropolitan area. So each of these polygons, which represents a zip code, has uh, asthma case data. And we were interested in how ozone relates to those. But we don't have ozone on an aerial basis for every county. We have ozone at monitoring locations. And so you know, we need to bring the x's and y's to the same uh, spatial resolution. And typically, the, the idea is uh, you often want to do your analysis, usually want to do your analysis on the scales of your Ys. So you're preserving the actual information content of your Y data uh, first and foremost. Um, and, but you then want to think about how we regrid, but not regrid, but, but do this, these sorts of spatial misalignment models uh, to bring uh, the, the X data to the same domain as the Y data. So if you had, so if we have point data that's, that's our, our X data and we want to bring point to block, we're going to do something like developing a, a, a Bayesian spatial point process data, a point process model, uh, kind of a generalization of a Krieging framework. Uh, so essentially Krieg uh, to a, a fine spatial resolution with uncertainty again. So, so such the output is thousands of maps preserve, preserving the covariance in those maps and then aggregate the predictions of those maps uh, to these uh, arbitrary political units. And then we would have uh, you know, uh, the expected value of ozone uh, with the propagation of uncertainty uh, into those uh, values. So this goes over that a uh, little bit in text points as well. Um, so we're when we have two spatially referenced variables, what interest in lies in some sort of spatial regression or some other spatial uh, nonlinear modeling or process modeling, uh, we can't fit a regression between two variables that are misaligned. Uh, so we could have analogous that we had with the basic misalignment where the x's are either point or block and the y's are either point or block and they're not always the same. Um, and again, the idea bring the x's to the scale of the y's and then fit the model. And if you have a model with more than two variables, you want to bring uh, all the variables to a common scale. Uh, and if possible, you want to bring those to the highest resolution. Uh, but that's not always computationally feasible. 
the other thing I'll, I'll note is uh, that there's kind of two ways you could approach this problem uh, of bivariate misalignment. One would be, the ideal situation would be to fit fit a, a, a joint model of everything. So fit a, a, a model that includes your spatial regression and simultaneously in, in includes this spatial misalignment so that you're ensuring that as you do the MCMC sampling, that you're fully capturing uh, that joint distribution in the covariance structure to its fullest. Um, and then, but in, in, in a practical basis, sometimes you need to split this into uh, two steps, uh, you know, the interpolation step and then the uh, spatial regression step. If you do need to sp split into two steps, it's really important to do everything you can to preserve uh, those spatial covariances. So again, you know, if I start by creating, you know, point data to some fine resolution map and I produce thousands of maps, when I move those to other points or to blocks, um, you know, it's important that I don't just, you know, when I do that, that spatial regression model essentially becomes an errors and variables model. These X's have uncertainties associated with them because of this spatial interpolation, that I don't just do that uh, errors and variable models independently, but I acknowledge that, um, that there is an important covariance structure. Uh, so you actually, you would write an errors and variable models for your X's where you have a joint distribution of the errors of all of your X's simultaneously, rather than uh, considering the errors in those X's independently. Uh, because that would again lead to a, a false sense of having greater information than you actually do. So as I wrap up, I want to point folks forward to kind of next steps. Um, we've covered uh, in this last chunk of the class, we covered uh, temporal data, time series modeling, we covered spatial data. Um, the obvious next step is how you bring those two together uh, in modeling spatial temporal data, as well as many more advanced uh, approaches to modeling spatial data. You know, we we, in time series, we talked about the, the fact that you could put spatial, uh, we could, you could put autocorrelation not just on process, but you could put it on a hierarchical uh, random effects. You can do the same thing with spatial models. You can build spatial models that have spatial random effects uh, for, say, a site random effect for location, and then look at those uh, spatial random effects and then ask. Can I, do I need to account for the autocorrelation of those spatial random effects and put a spatial model uh, on the covariance between those random effects? Um, and then you can think about models that have autocorrelations in time and autocorrelations in space simultaneously uh, and build more, uh, more spatial temporal statistics. This slide points to a few uh, references. Uh, since I borrowed uh, some of these slides from Sidupu Banerjee uh, based on you know, so my, my own earliest training, these approaches came from uh, the book Hierarchical Modeling and Analysis for Spatial Data back in 2003. Uh, since then, there's been two, two good books. Uh, more recently, uh, no, uh, Cressy and Weichel's 2011 uh, Stats for Spatial Temporal Data, which takes a very Bayesian approach. And then very recently, uh, a, a newer book by Chris Weichel, uh, Spatial Temporal Statistics with R, uh, which uh, if you go to the uh, space time with our website, uh, in addition to being able to you know, buy the hardbound book, you can actually get a free P PDF and, and see other resources at that website. So if, if I were to start today uh, in, in moving beyond uh, where we've kind of are ending this course um, and picking up with an interest in spatial and temporal data analysis, that would probably be a, a, a good place to start. Uh, with that, thanks. Uh, for everyone for, for sticking through uh, all of these videos. And uh, yeah, I'm going to sign off. Thanks.